Hello to everyone. Thank you so much for joining our Torah study this Shabbat. Uh, we are studying this week about, actually, it's called Vayera, and it's just so full and so rich. And I pray that you will be completely and wholly blessed and strengthened and encouraged and inspired tonight by this study of the word of God. And we are so blessed that Jim and Sue Sochi from United Kingdom are joining us for um, to lead us in a worship song, a song of worship and praise. So I'm going to mute myself. Let's all mute ourselves. And uh, we're going to turn it over to uh, Jim and Sue. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> Okay, this song is by the grace of God only. Um, we've chosen a song by Michael Card um, about uh, Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac uh, for this Torah study, which is a very uh, precious song. So. Thank you. 
probably can't even grasp why you would send your only son and allow him to go through all that he went through for us. But we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your outrageous love. And we thank you that you have done it, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jim and Sue. That song is so meaningful. Um, not only because uh, it goes together with what we're studying this week in, in this week's Torah portion, but also I think just personally, you know, both of us have lost a son. And uh, yes, and so it's a very, very meaningful song for us. It really touched my heart. Thank you. I remember at one point, um, just going to the Lord and in, in, you know, just all my grief and sorrow and mourning. And I felt like he said, um, I understand. I also lost a son. Yeah. So, yes, we praise God, even when we are allowed to share in his sufferings. Amen. 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 All right. Well, thank you so much, Jim and Sue. And uh, this Torah portion we are going to study is so massive. And um, and I also want to give an update on the situation in Israel and the war in Israel as well. So uh, we just ask for the grace, the grace of God to uh, help us with this. And uh, I'm going to just share my screen. Let's see where that, oh, share screen. All right, got it. And um, all right, just hang on a sec. And I'll pull up my, I have some slides to go along with our study today, some pictures and things. So, all right, let's see do that and now I'm going to try again share screen and there it is yes all right not as smooth this week but that's okay this week I think our patience is we're exercising patience all over the place so just um, let me know that you can see that I want to make it a little bit bigger for you so you can see the whole screen uh, so you should you should see that screen that says Voice for Israel. Oh, we've got a few more people wanting to come on. Just a second. All right. Ah. Right. With the time change, you know, we might we might have a few people coming on a bit a bit later that didn't realize, like us, it would affect the time of the Zoom. So, all right. Same and, here. <laughs> Shalom, Sharon. Was that? It? Yeah, we've got an issue here with the uh, <laughs> with the time change. Edward, can I may just make you co-host so you can keep an eye on uh, if anybody wants to be let in? Yeah, sure. That was on my mind too. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sorry, Hannah, okay. I didn't realize um, I was on the phone to a friend and then about 15 minutes ago, Edward was like, you know, I heard from Hannah? And I'm like, no. And then I checked. I was like, oh, no. So, I know. Well, thank, six minutes thank, God, thank God for my brother, Mark. Thank you, Mark. I, I see that you just came on, who sent a message to my son, Avi, who said, oh, you know, the Zoom is supposed to be starting. So anyways, uh, I think you saved us tonight. And so um, is it seven o'clock in Israel now, or what is it now? No, yeah, it's just seven o five right now. So I was right. thinking I still had like a half an hour. I was visiting uh, a yeah. friend. I was visiting an old friend that just lives down the street. Mm. And so, anyways, but we made it. Thank goodness. So yeah, I'm glad okay, to hear. That's really God's grace. That's really God's grace. So, um, you know, a few more like maybe Hillary might be coming on later or whatever. Um, How are you today, Hannah? 
How are you? How am I? How are you? How do you even answer that? Yeah, it is I well with my soul. <laughs> <laughs> we are well in the Lord, aren't we? We yeah. are blessed. We are mm. we are blessed, you know. There's so much going on. What's that? There's just so much going on, you know, more awful things are coming so out. So much and going on. And I, I think I need to exercise a little more self-discipline, not to be too much on mm. the news and on my phone. And if like at least, thank goodness, most of the channels where I'm getting the reports from, they close for Shabbat. Okay. Unless it's life-threatening emergency, oh, um, yeah. they, they go silent for Shabbat. So, you know, thank goodness for that. Mm. So that that, mm. that was good. So mm. we're gonna, I want to do a little update on the war first, a little war update first, because it's so relevant. I mean, it so ties in. It has been for the last, what, ever since we started? Yeah. Ever since we started again, from Genesis 1, 1, it's been so relevant to our situation today. And so as we see the whole world just falling into deception, um, you know, I think it, I'm so thankful that there is a faithful remnant of truth seekers and people that, you know, are willing to think for themselves and stand up. I saw... Um, I saw a video post today where this guy was going around to the university campuses and saying, uh, will you sign this petition, this pro Hamas, pro Palestinian um, petition that I'm, you know, that you're in support of, of them. And they're like, Oh, sure. You know, and they're ready to sign. And he says, then he says, well, I just have to tell you first some of the terms and conditions of what you're signing to make sure that you know what you're signing. They're like, oh, all right. And then he goes to he goes on with saying, all right, so you agree with the fact that women have to wear a hijab and they cannot uh, don't have any rights. And um, and they're like, oh, no, I don't agree with that. Oh, OK, well, all right, then I'm not signing. And like he just goes through all of it. And um, and then the people mm -hmm. end up walking away. No, no, I'm not signing that. I don't agree with that. So, you know, people mm -hmm. don't really realize what they are supporting when they are supporting this. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, so we know that the IDF has gone into Gaza um, to destroy the terror tunnels and to rescue the hostages. And of course, it's a very tricky situation because the hostages mm -hmm. are in most of them are in in these tunnels and so they've got to be very careful they can't just you know bomb the the tunnels and mm. um the families of the hostages that have been kidnapped are protesting in front of the um the government and uh well we just need to keep praying we just need to keep praying for their release i was just at the mall and the other day they had the whole ceiling was full of umbrellas white umbrellas that had the pictures of each hostage mm -hmm. on each umbrella and it was they were all hanging from the ceiling and it was just really powerful and you know praying that they'll be released and then I was kind of filming it and then I realized I was filming one of the hostages that they've already found her remains you know mm -hmm. so it's just really sad and like they did they didn't even find her body they could only find fragments of her, of her skull it's just horrible 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 it's medieval mm -hmm. it's barbaric mm -hmm. uh, but this it's is like the situation this is what we're dealing with oh mm -hmm. can i just i can i just ask everybody just mute yourselves for now because otherwise we've got all kinds of noise and stuff going on and, and all that and then just even have a little notepad if you can by your computer or whatever or your phone jot down any comments questions anything you want to talk about afterwards and then this is being recorded so this is going to go to everybody and then afterwards we're going to have a time of like personal sharing kind of off camera so all right everybody muted i don't know but okay i trust that you are all right and so of course we're praying for the safe return of of all these kidnapped israelis some of them are just babies um, in every message that I get on Telegram, it's like, pray for, you know, where are the babies? Pray for the children to be brought home. A lot of them don't have parents left, but some still do. I just cannot imagine, you know, if if not knowing what has happened to them or where they are, if they're all right. Just It's just 
unbelievable. But of course, this is their this is their, you know, trump card, right? This is the what they're holding on to. Well, we've got the hostages. And so Israel cannot really go in and do what they need to do because of wanting to bring back the hostages alive as many as possible. And um, you know, sometimes we just feel like this, like how long, oh Lord? You know, how long? Um, I read this in Psalm 94, verse three that I thought it was so powerful. And it starts with, and we've been talking a lot about, you know, God, um, that this is the year of the vengeance of the Lord. This is the time of the vengeance of the Lord. Like, like that, that the Lord roars. He's coming as the lion of Judah and he roars out, out of Zion. He's cut like the lion kind of rising up from his lair and roaring and ready to destroy the enemies of Israel. And so this Psalm 94, it says, Oh Lord God, to whom vengeance belongs. You know, we are not to take vengeance, but God uh, will take vengeance. And the, the blood of all these innocent civilians and all these innocent people just cries out from the ground. It says, rise up, O judge of the earth and render punishment to the proud Lord. How long will the wicked, how long will the wicked triumph? And that word for triumph in Hebrew means how long will they gloat or rejoice or exalt or celebrate? And we've all seen that, you know, just like the video, there was a, a post where it was like to all the people that are supporting Palestinians and Hamas, you know, and then it shows a video of how they rejoiced after 9-11, you know, when when they hit the Twin Towers and they're, they're you know, the same thing, the same thing. And this was also in Habakkuk, where he says, um, you know, how long, oh God, will will I cry out to you? This is just Habakkuk uh, chapter one. He says, oh Lord, how long will I cry out and you don't hear? I cry. Of course, God does hear. But this is, you know, the kind of the, the, the cry of our hearts. And how long will I cry out to you violence? And that word is, you know what the word is? Hamas. How long will I cry out to you, Hamas, and you will not save? Why do you, why do you show iniquity, the plundering and the violence that is the Hamas are ever before me? There's strife and contention and wickedness everywhere. The wicked surround the righteous, and so the prophets and the and the people who wrote the Psalms they all had these questions. And yet, in the end, they, they say, but we put our trust in you. We know that, God, that you will rise up, you know, rise up, arise, O Lord, and may all your enemies be scattered. Rise up and have vengeance for Zion's sake. We see seeing a rise of anti-Semitism all over the nations. This is just a little sample, you know, the the you know, so-called free Palestine. The only free pa free Palestine that needs to be done is to free the Palestinians from Hamas. And uh, the whole thing about is the, the lie about Israeli apartheid is such a lie and all of this. And it, just the whole world has gone mad. Here's a sign outside a store in, in Turkey. This is not 1940 whatever. This is 2023. This is October 2023. Jews not allowed. It was also signs outside shops in Paris. They're spray painting Star of Davids on Jewish shops to target them. Just like before, before you know, like in World War II and the Holocaust, there are signs outside shops in Paris saying no Jews allowed, Jews get out, death to Jews. Um, just all over in the UK at these gatherings, death to Jews, uh, university campuses. It's the world has gone crazy. That's all. That's all that we can say. And it it's just like you know history repeating itself. Uh, one of the in one of the craziest scenes was this uh, lynch mob. This Muslim lynch mob that stormed the airport. They they saw on Telegram, there's a Telegram channel that said that there was a flight coming from Tel Aviv full of Israelis. Well, actually some of them 
were children from Dagestan that had gone to Tel Aviv to receive medical treatment at Israeli hospitals. And they heard, and so the pilots diverted the flight to a different runway. They found out, they, they stormed the runway, they broke into the airport, and they were literally hunting for Jews. They stopped the cars. They were asking people for their documents to, to make sure to see whether they were Jewish or Israeli or not. By a miracle, there were none of the Israelis, none of the Jewish people were hurt. They evacuated them out of that area. But it just shows the level of violence, uh, these mobs um, that have started to organize and form because they've, been, they've all just been let into these countries. And now they're, it's like they're all coming out from under the rocks. And um, the Lord led me to the scripture in Jeremiah 16, 16, where it says that first, you know, it, there was like three stages. First, the Jewish people that come back to the land of their own accord because they're drawn by the Holy Spirit and they come like Psalm 126, you know, when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like in a dream where mouths are full of laughter and we're just like, ah, oh, this is unreal. This, this is so awesome. And then there was like the fishers. And then it says, and then there will come the fishermen that will fish for them. I was talking to my sister-in-law last night, who's from the Ukraine, Belarus. And she said, we were the ones that were drawn by the fishermen. The, the, the Sochnut came, they showed them videos, they taught them Hebrew, they taught them about the Feast of the Lord, and they encouraged them, and they gave them help, and they helped them to come, and they that's how they came. But now, it says, after the fishermen will come the hunters, and they will hunt for them, you know, in every place. And this is what they were doing. They were even checking in the engines, you know, to see if there was any Jews hiding in there. So this is becoming, this is not just an Israel issue anymore absolutely not this is a global issue this is a world issue out of the people that were murdered here in israel were from all over the world all over the world from europe from india from africa from thailand from, there was people murdered and kidnapped from all over the world and now it's like some people are waking up and others still are not getting it um, I, I listened to a video from, um, her name is Bridget Gabrielle, really powerful testimony. She was, uh, uh, she's from Lebanon. She's a Christian from Lebanon. And she talks about, she's very, very pro-Israel. She said the Israelis saved them. She, she was a little girl. And Lebanon let a big wave of Palestinians into their country. She said they destroyed their country. They absolutely destroyed their country. It was very progressive, democratic, for women's rights, multicultural. They prided themselves, commerce, business. And they let in this whole wave of um, Palestinian refu you know, refugees. And they, they completely destroyed the country and turned it into this Islamic um, regime that then attacked the Christians and of course the Jews, but they were Lebanese Christians and they um, destroyed her home. Uh, she was in the hospital for many months and then they had to live in this tiny bomb shelter. They had no water, no electricity, no food. And she said it was the Israelis that saved them. They kept thinking, somebody's going to come and save us. Surely somebody is going to come and save us, our people. But it was the Israelis that came and she's very, very pro-Israel. And she has a lot to say. If you want to look her up, she has a lot of really um, good information and really powerful um, things to say to the nations about what is really going on and um, well worth looking at. And, you know, I saw this post and I thought, this is so true. It says, we are not doing this to teach them a lesson. We're doing it because we learned ours. You know, we, we have learned a lesson about trying to appease them and trying to make peace with people that just want to kill you. Trying to negotiate the people that want to like mutilate people and torture them and kill your children. I mean, we we have learned a lesson and I, I hope to God, I hope to God that Israel has finally, finally 
learned a lesson because there's so much world pressure and the world is completely, as I said, once Israel goes into Gaza and starts fighting back and defending ourselves, all the world will turn against Israel. And that's exactly, of course, what's happening. And also some Jewish people. I am sorry to say, and I'm ashamed to say, but there are Jewish people that are leftist, very like liberal, you know, they want to show the world how liberal they are. And so they're also, they're also supporting this. And so it's really, really crazy. And we have to keep praying that the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth. That will lead and guide us into all truth. And so we've got to stay so close to the Holy Spirit to, to keep us walking in truth and not to be walking in a deception. Now, this I thought was so relevant. This is about when Israel came out of Egypt, Amalek attacked them. It says Amalek came and they fought with Israel at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, let's go out. We've got to fight Amalek. And as we've been saying, you know, our true battle, this true, this war is really with the spirits of darkness that are behind these people. These same spirits of darkness that were in Hitler and the Nazis and in all the people throughout the centuries that have tried to annihilate the Jewish people are the same ones that are in Islamic Jihad today. And so they went out and they fought with Amalek. This is an ancient enemy and the spirit of Amalek is still operating today. And it says whenever Moses held up his hands, Israel prevailed. So there was Moses on the mountain holding up his hands, Joshua down there with the soldiers, with the IDF, you know, fighting on the ground. And as long as Moses held up his hands to God, then they prevailed. But when he let his hands down, then Amalek prevailed. And it's showing us that God is our help. God is our source. God is the one, even though we have this incredible IDF, but God is the one that we need to fight for us. And so we need you to help to support our hands because Moses' hands got tired. And so Aaron came on one side, Hor came on the other side, and they held up his hands so that Israel would, would have victory and would triumph in this battle with Amalek. And this is what we need. We need you to keep holding up our hands to God and because we, we're getting weary and tired of the battle when we see the whole world against us it can just you know be tempting to just lose heart and so to know that we have people who are supporting us and who are praying for us and who are holding up our hands you know so i just wanted to say to the rabbah i wanted to say thank you so much for holding up our hands in prayer it says that Moses hands became heavy and so they took a stone and he sat down Aaron and her and and they held up his hands until the going down of the sun and Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword and so yes the IDF is in there fighting against the enemies but we need to be the ones that are looking to God and that are praying to God and we need you to just continue to keep holding us up in prayer and then Moses built an altar they had they triumphed they had the victory and Moses built an altar and he called the its name Jehovah Nisi this is so interesting I think Sue we need another chapter in the book just on this name Jehovah Nisi because Jehovah Nisi means the Lord is my banner a, a Ness is a banner he says because the Lord has sworn like when God swears something that's a serious promise the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation that means forever God is is at war with Amalek and whoever supports Amalek has now made themselves an enemy of God this word Nisi comes from the word Ness, which means a flag or a banner. It also means a miracle. It's the same word as miracle. So when the tribes of Israel were, were positioned around the tabernacle, they were all each tribe was positioned under their Ness, 
under their banner, under their flag, and it's a rallying point for the troops. And this is so amazing. I read this today in Psalm 60. I tell you, the word of God is just so relevant and coming so alive because it's like we're living it right now. A Psalm 60. Um, it says, and, and this is like how we feel. And I think how a lot of Israelis feel. Oh God, you have cast us off. You have broken us down. You've been displeased. Restore us again. You've made the earth tremble. You have broken it. Heal its breaches for it is shaking. You have shown your people hard things. You have made us drink the wine of confusion. A lot of people are, are, are confused. How has God allowed this to happen to us? And then it says in verse four, you have given a banner to those who fear you, that it may be displayed because of the truth. So God has given us a banner to display. And God says, I will divide Shechem. I will measure out the valley of Sukkot. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is the helmet for my head. Judah is my lawgiver. Moab, my washpot. Over Edom, I will cast my shoe. Philistia. And then it says, you, O oh God, give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. Through God, we shall do valiantly, and it is he who shall tread down our enemy. Through our God, we shall do valiantly, it is he who shall tread down our enemy. We'll sing and shout the victory, Messiah is king. Hallelujah. Okay, so that is, that's where it comes from, Psalm 60. Through our God, we shall do valiantly, and it is he shall tr sh that shall tread down our enemies. And in Psalm 20 is another place where it talks about the banners. We will sing for joy over your victory. We will sing for joy over Israel's victory. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners, our nests, our miracle, our flag, our, our rallying point for our troops. May the Lord fulfill all your peti petitions. And I love seeing the videos of the IDF singing and dancing their, their praise before the Lord before they go into battle and saying, Ana Adonai Hoshiana, Ana Adonai Hatzlikana, God save us, God give us victory, God give us success. They're not going in there just trusting in their, you know, their own arm, their own rifle, their own strength, their own snipers. They are trusting in God. And that is our secret weapon. Trusting in God and knowing that we are fighting for our survival. We are fighting for our very survival. And so may God lift up that banner of victory over Israel. And we need a miracle. <laughs> I love that. Uh, David Ben-Gurion said, in Israel, in order to be a realist, you must believe in miracles. We've got to believe in miracles. And uh, the fact that Israel still exists today and has survived, surrounded by all these enemies and nations that have vowed to push us into the sea, it's a miracle. Psalm 124 says, unless the Lord had been on our side, they would have swallowed us up alive a long time ago. So thanks be to God. And let us always remember that the his banner over me is love. God has a banner flying over us. He got a flag flying over us. And that says, Ahava. It says love. It says, I love you. That is the banner that flies over each and every one of us that says, I love you. Signed, God. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> he brought me to his banqueting house. They say banqueting house because they don't want to say it's the house of wine. He brought me to his house of, uh, yes, in Hebrew, it's he brought me to his house of wine. But they don't want to say that. So he brought me to his banqueting house. No, it's the house of wine. Brought me to his banqueting table. His banner over me is love right? It's actually brought me to his house of wine and his banner over me is love. Yes. 
<laughs> you know what? There's very little alcoholism in 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 the in uh, amongst the Jewish people. And I'm not saying you 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 need to drink wine. I'm not you know making a judgment call on anybody here. But we use a, a, a sanctified wine, a kiddush wine on Friday nights, and you know it kind of represents. Um, um, the cup of joy, the cup of salvation, you know, and we sometimes say, you know, Yeshua didn't change the water into grape juice, but that's okay. I don't even know why I'm talking about wine. Okay. That's not our topic at all, at all. Forget that. I'll edit it out of the video. <laughs> okay. So here we're, okay. That's enough of that. We are uh, into our study tonight, which is called Vayera. Remember that as we go through this, Take notes, write down questions, things you want to share. Afterwards, it's going to be your turn to just share your heart, ask questions or whatever, pray about stuff. We're starting in Genesis chapter 18. I love some of this stuff in this study. So even the word, okay, if we just start with this word, vayera, you can see it in the Hebrew there. It's from the opening sentence, the Lord appeared, vayera. Adonai to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. And some scholars believe that he was con still convalescing after his circumcision. After all, he was 99 years old when he was circumcised, a little different than eight days old. So yeah, so he might still have been convalescing. But anyways, he was also, you know, you don't sit out in the sun in the in the Negev, in the desert. In, you know, in the middle of the day. So he was in his tent, in the shade, and God appeared. Vayera. Okay. So the word is, Vayera is, and he appeared. But if we look at the word itself in Hebrew, it has a lot of derivatives and meanings that we can get out of it. So this, these, this root word, Yud, Resh, Aleph, with a hey on the end, is the name of God that Abra Abraham called God when he almost sacrificed his son Isaac. And he called the place, he called it Jehovah Yireh. He called, this is where we get the name of, you know, that song, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh. My provider is grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. Well, okay, so there's no J in Hebrew. So it's not Jehovah and it's not Jireh. You can say that if you want, but there is no J in Hebrew. It's a Yud, it's a Y sound. Ye, Yehovah, Yir, E. And that means God will see because this word, Yir, E, Re, E, it means to see, to see or to perceive. It's also the root word of to fear or reverence. And so fear of the Lord is Yirat Adonai, Yirat Yehovah. And it's these are all using the same root word. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it says in Revelation 15, 4, who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? And, uh, you know, the problem that we say, that we see today is many people, even in the churches, have lost the fear of the Lord. Or it has le at least decreased, you know, as if like, well, whatever we do, you know, there's just, you know, greasy grace and it's okay. And God's not going to judge and God's not going to punish him. And God's just love. And that's just so out of balance. So out of balance. We need to walk in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we want to have wisdom, which it says in Proverbs 8, wisdom is the primary thing that we need. There is nothing that you desire that compares to her. We just need wisdom. So to have wisdom, we need the fear of the Lord. Um, so we put all this together. It's like when God appears to us, when we see him, when we perceive him in all of his glory, that's when we will walk in the fear of the Lord. And this, you know, that beautiful song, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. And also praying that the eyes of our heart can be enlightened to know the hope to which he has called us. 
So we can pray and ask God, God, open the eyes of my heart that I may see you. Would you appear to me so that I can see you, so I can perceive who you really are? So that's just a whole sort of word study from the Hebrew on this word year e and the name Yehovah year e it means that God it's usually translated God will provide but it actually means God will see and then the assumption is that God will see what we need and then provide it. okay so God provided the lamb all right so here we go so Abraham was you know in his tent and he sees three men approaching men so if we look at the Hebrew, which we always need to do, was it really men? Yes. The word used was anashim. Anashim means people, men. So Abraham, he just saw three men coming, anashim. And when he saw them, he hurried from his entrance and he bowed down to the ground to meet them. This is just kind of Middle Eastern hospitality, 1000 X, <laughs> you know, just can you imagine you go and visit somebody and they just start bowing, you know, down, they lay on their face uh, on the ground. But um, in, in the Middle East, hospitality is very important. And it's a, quite different from like North American, European. It's, it's kind of like anybody can show up at your door at any time and you're just, um, you know, you're just uh, expected to just drop whatever you're doing and sit down and pull out the whole fridge and you get out the cake and you get out the cookies and you get out the tea and the coffee and you, you know, you treat this person like a very honored guest. Well, I wasn't used to that coming from, <laughs> from Canada and I have people showing up at my door and I'm thinking, why didn't you call? Why don't you like give me a heads up? What if I'm doing something? You know, and I like had little kids and when they were napping, I was trying to write my books while they nap. Always somebody show up my door, always when the kids are napping and I'm trying to write. So I thought I'm going to be smart. And I put a little sign on my door. Caution, woman at work, do not disturb. That totally didn't work. Totally didn't work. It's like meaningless. Okay. Because it's just Middle Eastern hospitality. Oh, one time we were, we were driving to Jerusalem. Liat was just a little girl. She was two years old. And um, I don't think Avi was even born yet. And it was winter and it was cold. And our van broke down. And um, this just to give you a little contrast between Middle Eastern and North American kind of hospitality standards. So uh, our van broke down. And we were on the side of the road. And it was cold. We um, saw a car go by us and then he swung around did a ue and came back and he parked behind us and this guy i think his name was shlomo i'm trying to remember um and he said uh what you know can i help you what's going on and and i said well we're having a little bit of of car trouble and he said well it's cold you know get you you can warm up you can warm up in my car and he gets into the van he starts trying to start start it and and, uh, and then he said, can I take you to a restaurant to get something to eat? Do you need a place to stay tonight if we don't get the car? I'm like, no, we're okay. We're okay. We were heading to um, stay at uh, the home of a Christian volunteer, some Christian, a couple that were volunteering for a Christian ministry that were coming from America. And we were headed there. And he, it's just like he couldn't do enough for us. And he was praying. He had his he had his arm out the window and he was hollering. I thought he was mad about something, but he was just praying. He was praying up a storm. God, get this van working. And we did get the van working eventually. And so we drove into Jerusalem and we at, landed at the um, people's place. And like not to be critical or judgmental or anything, but we didn't even get a cup of tea. We were freezing and and hungry and cold and tired. And we didn't even get offered a cup of tea. We, we like, we had a place, we had a place where we could crash, we could sleep, but I mean, we weren't fit. And it's just, it's just a different culture. It's just really, and I know not everybody, I, I'm sure that you guys would give us a cup of tea. I'm not saying that. 
<laughs> but it, it really is a different kind of level of hospitality. And we see this also not just in Abraham, but in Lot. Remember, he saw the strangers. They were angels, but he didn't know they're angels because they looked like men, which means that we could totally be walking past angels, you know, on the street. Totally. He just looked like men. And he invited them to come home and stay in his in his house like they're strangers like that's like hospitality we don't see that anymore you know and you do have to be careful i'm not saying take everybody into your house my then husband um found somebody that was like sleeping on the beach and just brought him home you know and i know that it says that we should bring you know homeless people into our home but like i was like eh, you know and later we found out that this guy was like a pedophile you know and so yeah, he had to be banned from the congregations because he was going into the congregations and kind of preying on people, kids. So I'm like, oh, thank God, you know, nothing happened. But I know you have to be careful, but it's just an example of Lot, here's strangers, and he just says, come on, you have to, he insisted, you, you're not going to sleep here, you come and stay at my house. You know, so it's just really a uh, crazy kind of hospitality here. And so here's Abraham you know, hosting these three men. And the question comes up, can God appear in human form? Well, according to this chapter in Genesis 18, it's absolutely, absolutely. Two of these men were angels and one was the Lord. He was Jehovah God. <laughs> So it's yes. The answer to the question is yes, but not according to the 13 principles of Jewish faith. This Maimonides was a scholar. He created these 13 principles, foundation of the Jewish faith. A lot of them are really good. It's like, you know, there's only one God and, and uh, you know, one of them says we believe with, it's called anima amin, which means I believe. And it's like, I believe with all my heart in the coming of the Messiah. You know, there's a lot of good things in there. But one of them says, I believe with complete faith that the creator, blessed be his name, is incorporeal, free from all, these are big words, and anthropomorphic properties. He has no likeness at all. What they're really saying is God is a spirit and cannot appear in human form, in material form at all. This word incorporeal, I had to look it up. It means not composed of matter, not composed of physical matter, having no material or physical existence. And anthropomorphism is the attribution of human characteristics to non-human entities. All right. So that is a basic foundation of the Jewish faith. So do we wonder why they can't accept Yeshua? But it's all throughout our scriptures. Throughout our scriptures, we see examples. This is one in this parasha is that the Lord and two angels came and they ate. <laughs> they ate with Abraham. So Asher Entrader has written a book called Who Ate Lunch with Abraham? And the question is, can you see God? It's about the appearances of God in the form of a man in the Hebrew scriptures. And it says there is a figure who appears throughout the Hebrew scriptures sometimes referred to as the angel of the Lord and sometimes as God himself, sometimes as the son of man. And it says we need to kind of reevaluate uh, the Jewish faith. And, and you know, in, in light of this, we need to go by the scriptures, not by tradition. Oh, one of the example, of course, is the fourth man in the fire, right? There's another in the fire standing next to me right the fourth fourth man in the fire look they looked into the fire and he says look i see four men loose they threw in shadrach meshach and abednego that's a chaj time shalosh that's one two three but then they looked and they saw arba they saw four men in the fire and they were not hurt and they said and the fourth man looks like the son of god okay so there is another example of the Son of God appearing in human form. Walking in the fire, it says they came out, they didn't even smell like smoke. Uh, another one is when Jacob wrestled with God 
And so Jacob called the place Peniel, which means the face of God, because he said, I have seen God face to face. He didn't say I've seen the angel face to face. He said, I have seen God face to face. That is Panim El Panim. And my life has been preserved. And so this is another instance where God appeared in human form. All right. We talked a little bit about hospitality. I got, I think I got a little ahead of myself in my zeal and passion to tell my stories. But it says um, in the New Testament, 1 Peter 4, 9, it says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Well, why does it say be hospitable without grumbling? Why would we complain about having to practice hospitality? Well, I can tell you why. <laughs> because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to, you know, to, to have people over and to cook the whole meal. And then you got the whole cleanup afterwards. Sometimes you have a whole bunch of people and you got, you know, there were times when we like hosted a Passover or Sukkot or something with all the family and guests and international people. And, you know, it might be up till like four in the morning, just, just cleaning up. So that's why it says, you know, do it without grumbling. And Abraham said, he invited these people. He insisted, if I found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought. Let let you, you, you can all wash your feet and rest under this tree. And I'm going to get you something to eat. So you'll be refreshed and go on your way. He's so happy that these people came and that he can offer them hospitality. And it tells us that we should not forget to entertain strangers because by doing so, some have entertained angels. You know, when we when we invite people to our home and give them a meal, they could be angels because these angels look just like men and so did the Lord. And so there's a lot of angelic activity in this parasha, a lot of angels. It says that the angels of the Lord encamp all around those who Fear him. Remember the fear of the Lord, Yirat Adonai? The angels of the Lord encamp around those who fear him to deliver them. And you know, every time I get in my car, well, I wouldn't say every time. Most of the times that I get in my car, hopefully I remember, I say, thank you, God, for giving your angels charge over us to keep us in all of our ways and for protecting us as we drive. Because driving in Israel is crazy. And so, especially in the South, oh my goodness. So, you know, we just need angels to, to guard us because it says in Psalm 91 that God will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. That's a really good thing to pray when you get into your car to drive, even when you just go out your door. Just pray for angels to God to send angels to, to guard and to keep you. These are the angelic, reinforcements that God has to watch over us and to keep us. And something that I've been praying is praying that God will dispatch a whole charge full of angels to guard our IDF soldiers. I thank God that we have had, I hate to say minimal losses because each one is a tragedy, just a tragedy beyond even words, I just, just to see their beautiful faces and, uh, yeah, just beyond, beyond. And so I'm, I don't want to like minimize, but I mean, it could be so much worse. And I think it's just because of the prayers of the saints is because so many have been praying for our, our IDF, our soldiers, please continue to pray for Yosef, pray for Nati. Um, I was just with Yosef's mother my sister-in-law last night and I just looked at her and started crying <laughs> and she started crying and just hugged her just to know, you know, and she said those three days that Yosef was in Gaza, he was in Sterot, he was in the areas where the terrorists were and he was in there without a bulletproof vest. And, and she said the helmet was so terrible that he had that it kept falling over his his eyes he couldn't even see it was like worse than not having a helmet she said I, I I couldn't breathe I couldn't eat you know 
until I knew that he was all right and he came out of there. So thank God for giving his angels charge over our IDF, our soldiers, our police, our civilians, and for each and every one of you, for each and every one of us. Amen, amen. Okay, so switching to this meal that they had, okay? Abraham goes and, and tells Sarah, Sarah, go and prepare a calf. And, you know, they slaughtered the fatted calf and prepared like a big meal for these for these people, these three men. But look at this, okay? This is where I want to show you there's a huge difference between biblical faith and rabbinic Judaism, okay? What concerns me is when people start to, you know, thank God they want to learn about their Jewish roots. They want to understand, you know, scriptures in, the, in a Jewish context. But the trap is, if people start getting into rabbinic Judaism, because there are a lot of man-made and non-biblical elements of rabbinic Judaism, just like mainstream Christianity. Okay, but they both kind of gone, you know, right and left. Okay, and we're trying to walk this biblical narrow path that leads to life. Because one of the re a really strong tradition in rabbinic Judaism is the strict separation of meat and milk you you we we must separate dairy products from from meat products in fact uh, according to halakha halakha is you know how we kind of walk it out how do we walk out our religion according to halakha um it's not even to mix in our digestive tract so if you have milk you have to wait a certain number of hours before you have milk. I'm not telling you this so you will do this. I'm telling you this so you will not do this, okay? Because it is not biblical. It is not biblical. Now, you come to Israel, it's the way it is here. You're not going to get, you know, uh there's milk dairy restaurants that serve, you know, maybe pasta with cream sauce or whatever, you're not going to get meat at that restaurant. And then there's meat restaurants. You're not going to find any milk. You can't get cream for your coffee. If you've had a meat meal, you go to a hotel and you have a meal with meat, you're not going to get cream for your coffee. You're not going to get butter for your rolls because there's a very strong tradition to separate meat and milk. But if we look at Abraham and the Lord and the two angels and what they ate, they ate the milk and the calf and the and the and the butter and they they ate it all together. So it's not biblical. It's just it's tradition. It comes from half of a verse that says you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. As far as I'm concerned, that is more about kindness to animals and um, not really about this whole system of kashrut, this whole system of, you know, that you have to have the kosher stamp. And then there's, you know, so many different kinds of kosher stamps and there's different levels of kashrut. And for the, the restaurants have to have the stamp of the rabbis that uh, it's, it's just a whole huge industry, but biblically it, it's okay. I say, if it's okay for, for God himself and the angels, if it's okay for the Lord and the angels to eat milk and meat together, then I, you know, I think it's okay for us. But in Israel, don't ask for a cheeseburger at McDonald's. If it's kosher, McDonald's, you're not going to get a cheeseburger and you're not going to be able to get an ice cream cone <laughs> after your burger. Okay. Uh, kashrut, kosher, it's, it's a very strong tradition. Um, and sometimes there are even believers you know believers messianic believers are so diverse everybody thinks something different everybody believes something different and so um i'm not sure if i told you this story before but i'll tell this story again because maybe i still need to forgive and let it go and i went to a, a messianic congregation i can't even remember what city it was or the name of it so don't worry about it and they were having like a you know, shared meal afterwards. So everybody was expected to bring something. I made a Mexican casserole, which was really, really great. And on the top, we had some melt, some uh, grated uh, cheddar cheese. And, um, <laughs> okay, I mean, this does not nullify the fact that there are foods that biblically we are not supposed to eat, you know, pork and shellfish and things like that. Those are biblically not kosher, but I'm just talking about meat and milk. And um, 
we were in the service and all of a sudden I heard somebody shriek and she said, who brought this? And I, <laughs> I looked over, she was pointing at my casserole dish, my casserole. And I'm like, oh, I'm hiding. I'm not owning up to this. And she just was disgusted and she took it off the table and put it in the kitchen. This was a Messianic congregation. Okay, this was not a rabbinic, you know, orthodox uh, congregation, but she took, so I was so offended. I went after the service. I got my casserole, took it home and ate it, you know. And so it's it's a very, very strong tradition. And we know believers that that also keep this, not judging them, but I it's not biblical. Tradition is very strong. There's a picture of Fiddler on the Roof. You know that song that Tevye sings, tradition, 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 you know, and he dances around if you've seen Fiddler on the Roof. So I, when I came to faith, I did not know the difference between what was scripture, what did God say, and what was just rabbinic traditions. I had to start to read the Bible to understand what is just a tradition and what is Torah truth. Uh, Isaiah said, these people come near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is made up of rules taught by men. And Yeshua had so many arguments with the religious people of his day because they were teaching these man-made rules, like you have to separate meat and milk, as if these are the doctrines of God. And God never said that. So, you know, we need to kind of sort this out. And it's probably the same thing with Christianity. You know, what is just a tradition that I've inherited from generations? And what has God said in his word? All right. So now we come to the place. The Lord and the angels are on a mission. One of their missions is to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah and to see if it's as bad as they've heard the other mission was to tell sarah that next year at this time we're going to come back and you're going to have a son it says at the appointed time that is at the moed i will return to you about this time next year and sarah will have a son and i was just thinking you know how are things going to be different for us a year from now you know, if the angel said a year from now, we're going to return to you and things are going to be different. You know, what promises has God made to us? So they made a promise to Sarah. Sarah was listening at the end. You know how we like to do that? Do you? I like to do that. You know, we like to kind of just lurk in corners and listen to what people are, you know, the, the important people are saying. And so she was listening at the entrance to her tent and Abraham and Sarah were already very old. And it says that Sarah was past the age of childbearing. That means she was heavy and in, into menopause. Abraham was very old. And so Sarah laughed. She just laughed. She laughed, I'm worn out. My, my husband is also old. Will I now have this pleasure, you know, of, of having a son? It was ridiculous to her. She goes, this is ridiculous. And so she just laughed, you know, and, and I want us to think not just about Abraham and Sarah. Don't think just about Abraham and Sarah. Think about our own lives. What is there in our own life that is just seems so ridiculous that we would just laugh? If somebody would say, if somebody would say to you by next, by this time next year, you will whatever. Fill in the blank. Just, I want you to, I want you to take a piece of paper and I want you to fill in that blank. What is that thing that you think, well, that's impossible. That could never happen. I'm too old. It's too late. No way. Not for me. You know, write that thing down. That thing that if somebody said that, whatever it is, by next year, you're going to be married. By next year, you're going to be out of debt. By next year, you're going to be strong and healthy. By next year, you, you're not even going to remember the depression, okay? That when you would hear that, you just laugh. You got you you got to be kidding me. That could never happen. That was Sarah's reaction. And of course, I mean she's old, but it says that Abraham didn't waver in faith. He didn't look at his own body. He didn't look at things. In other words, he didn't look at things in the natural. 
What if a year from now you are delivered from something that has held you in bondage all your life? It says that Abraham didn't look at the things in the natural, but he believed God and God counted that as righteousness for him. Now, God commanded uh, fruitfulness. He commanded in the very beginning, he said, be fruitful and multiply. And it says that children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is our reward. In, in Hebrew, it's almost like our salary. It's like, you know, this is the reward we get. But there were many people that experienced, even in the Bible, the, the pain of infertility. And in Middle Eastern culture, especially, it's considered like to be like, like you're cursed if you don't have children. And, and so this is why it was so painful. One of the women that was not uh, able to have children was Hannah in the Bible. And she, her, the other wife had lots of children and she kind of taunted her, you know, and her name was Penina. She taunted her and Hannah was so sad about it. And her husband said, aren't I better to you than, you know, 10 sons? And she was like, well, not really. And um, so she eventually did have a son who was Samuel and that he became the great, great prophet Samuel. Also, Rachel uh, was barren for 20 years. And she said to uh, Jacob, you know, give me children or I will die. And he said, he got mad. He said, you think I'm God? Uh, because the the understanding at this time is that God is the one who opens and closes the womb. And we see this in the story of Abimelech when Abraham gives his wife Sarah over to Abimelech. And because of that, God plagued the women and closed up all. None of them could have children. He closed their wombs. And, you know, there's such a pain of infertility. I think that anyone who has experienced this can, can really relate to this. And apparently um, one out of eight American couples uh, struggle to conceive, to conceive. And, you know, even our, in our own family, you know, we have experienced this. And I, so I, I understand, you know, the pain and the, and the struggle that goes with this. And then what, uh, incredible blessing when the little one comes along, you know, when, when they're able to conceive and to have a child. It's just such, such a blessing. And, um, and I love this scripture that I think can really give hope to women that have not had children um, because God can give, can give the barren woman spiritual children and it says sing barren woman rejoice those who have never had a child burst into song and shout for joy you have who have never been in labor for the deserted wife will have more children than the woman who is living with her husband and it says he grants the barren woman a home like a joyful mother of children so i i think that we should pray that anyone who is struggling with infertility right now, that they will be healed, that God will open the womb, that they will be able to have the children that their heart desires. Amen. Amen. So now they're really, Abraham and Sarah are really challenged by the angels and by the Lord. <laughs> the Lord says to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, well, I really have a child now. I'm too old. And th there's this, this scripture is so powerful. It says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Ah, Lord, it says in Jeremiah, thou has made the heavens and the earth. Nothing is impossible with you. Is anything too hard for you? No, nothing. And so the angels say, that they will return at the Moed at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And God kept his promise. Sometimes we're waiting a long, long, long time, and we wonder why it can't come sooner. But God knows the right time. There is a set time. 
for his promises to come to pass in our lives. There is a moed, an appointed time. And we need to be patient. We need to wait for that appointed time. It says in Mark eleven twenty four. therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. That's an incredible statement. But I'll tell you what can stand in the way of us receiving the promise is unbelief. It says, beware of an evil heart of unbelief. Unbelief can really actually um, can, can prevent us from walking in our destiny. It says that the Israelites were not able to enter into the promised land. Why? Because of their unbelief. And even Yeshua could not do many miracles in Nazareth because of the people's unbelief. They didn't have faith. And in Psalm 78, it says they limited the Holy One of Israel with their doubt and their unbelief. And this made God furious. They said, can God provide? Can God do this? Can God do that? And God was furious after he had just poured out the 10 plagues on Egypt. They're asking now, can God provide, you know, water in the desert? Or And it says that all things are possible to those who believe. And sometimes we need to say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. So here's how it goes. Pray, believe, and receive. But remember that there is an appointed time. We're so used to everything being instant. Sarah and Abraham had to wait a long time for the promise to come to pass. It says faith sees the invisible, believes the incredible, and receives the impossible. You know who said that is Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom, who went, survived through the Nazi concentration camps who went into the into the concentration camps of the Nazis because of standing uh, with the Jewish people. And that's what she said. Faith sees the invisible, believes the incredible, and receives the impossible. So let us say, you know, even if we, even if it's hard, if we have to say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief, help us to have faith. Let faith arise and let us be patient. Because it says, by faith and patience, we inherit the promises. So there is a set time. There is a moed, not just for the feasts and festivals, but for things to happen in our lives. There was a set time for Isaac to be born. Sarah didn't want to wait, and she created an Ishmael. We studied that in last week's, right? We don't want to create an Ishmael. We There's no grace. When we create an Ishmael, you know, something that God has not ordained, it was not his will or not his timing. You know, it was not his will for Abraham to sleep with Hagar and, you know, and have Ishmael. The promise was to come through Sarah. And sometimes we just think, I'm not enough. I can't do this. I'm too old. Um, it's too late. I can't do this. I need to find somebody else who will make this happen for me. And that's a lie. That's a deception because the promise is in a God. If God has given us the promise, the promise is in us. And we don't need to look around for an Hagar to do it for us. That, that will just create an Ishmael and there's no grace for an Ishmael. Frustration, strife, nothing works. That's when we have created an Ishmael, when we have forced something in our own strength. I'll tell you a funny story that I think illustrates this. We had um, in Israel a, a this, this, I wish I could show it to you, but it was a thing that held envelopes and it had this stick that, that like it had a point on the end of the stick. And so you take your envelope and you'd, and you'd put it, you know, when you finish with it, you'd put it down on this pointy stick and it would hold it there so it wouldn't fly off the uh the the table or whatever right and so my i have to say my then husband because ex-husband now but you know then he was my husband and so he <laughs> he was pretty strong and and he had a way of like he wanted to make things happen what he wanted to happen and so he um took this envelope and he was trying to push it down over the pointy stick and he was struggling and he was you know a groaning and trying his hardest finally 
got it over the over the stick and the whole envelope was like ripped and destroyed and I looked and he had not taken off the little plastic nib <laughs> off the protect of the pokey thing that's kind of how it is when we are trying to force something to happen in the flesh we need to wait on God for his moed his set time is anything too hard for the Lord absolutely not at the appointed time I will return to you this time next year, Sarah will have a son. I want you to start thinking about what you want to believe God for at this time next year. All right. God kept his promise and Isaac, the child of promise was born. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age. At when? The Moed. At the set time of which God had spoken to him. Timing. Well, it's not everything, but it's almost everything. <laughs> so important that we know not just the will of God, but the timing of God. Liat painted a beautiful picture that says he makes all things beautiful in his time. It's not always our timetable. And sometimes it seems like God is too late. But God is never too late, but he's got his set time for things to happen. And look what his name means, okay? Abraham, he was circumcised on the eighth day, and Abraham called the name of his son Yitzchak. In English, doesn't mean so much, Isaac. In Hebrew, Yitzchak means laughter. Laughter. Why? Because when we wait on God for his set time, and God does it, and God brings it forth. It brings joy. It brings laughter. It doesn't bring strife and frustration, like trying to force the envelope on the on the stick. So it's really cute how Sarah says this in Hebrew. It says, Sarah said, God has made me laugh. But in Hebrew, it's Shehu Tzchok. And Tzchok is a joke. So it's like Sarah saying, God has really played a joke on me. And everyone who hears about it is going to laugh. And there's the word Yitzchak. That's his name. Everyone will laugh, Yitzchak, on account of me. So a beautiful name for the child of promise. That means joy or laughter. And now Abraham reveals what is going to happen. God's been speaking to me about this. That God will warn us about things that are coming. I just heard from somebody last night that said three days before October 7th, uh, I just had this sense that something terrible was coming. And she said, I it wasn't just like anxiety, but it was it was just that she had this sense that something was coming and she didn't know what it was. God said, Shall I hide from Abraham that which I'm doing? For I have known him to the end that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord, to do righteousness and justice. You know, there's such a high calling on fathers. Abraham, you know, he, Abraham was called to be a father, to be a father of many nations. And it's such a noble thing. God calling a father to direct his children after him. And the enemy has done such a number on just separating families and alienating uh, children from, from fathers and from mothers and di causing division and trouble and, um, and really sort of uh, robbing men of their masculine power, in a sense, to be the fathers that they need to be. But there's a beautiful promise where God says, I'm going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. And that is a, a beautiful promise that I believe that we need to pray for that. Maybe that is something that's going to happen around this time next year. Maybe there's going to be some family um, restoration and reconciliations of relationships. So God will reveal secrets to the righteous. 
He will warn us of things that are coming. Proverbs 3.32, it says, for the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the upright. You know, God gave secret counsel to Daniel so that he could interpret things, so that he knew things. Um, God warned Noah of the coming flood so he would build an ark. God warned Joseph that there would be a famine, seven years of famine coming, that they need to store up the grain. Um, God warned Moses that Pharaoh would not listen to him. He would not let the Israelites uh, go free. He warned him. Um, God warned Joseph, the you know, father of, of Yeshua, the human stepfather, we would say, of Yeshua. God warned him that Yeshua's life was in danger. And in a dream, he told him to take him out of the country and take him into Egypt. And then he told him when it was safe to bring him back. And in this instance, God warns Abraham that he is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Why is that? Why why should Abraham need to know this information? Because his nephew Lot, if you remember, Abraham told there was strife, and Abraham's told Lot, take whatever land you want, you know, take whatever you want, and I'll take the rest. And Lot chose to live near or in Sodom. And so he was going to be in danger. The Lord said that the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great. Their sin is so grievous that I will go down there and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. And if not, I will know. Do we not think that the outcry that is going up to the Lord and the angels against Hamas and what they have done, that their sins of murder and kidnapping and rape and mutilation and, and burning people alive. And do we not think that this sin is so grievous that this cry is not going up to the Lord? Surely, surely the cry is going up to the Lord. It's interesting here to note that somehow Abraham has caught on that these are not ordinary men. He knows now. So two of the angels went down to see Sodom and Gomorrah. And who was left standing? Abraham was left standing before the Lord. yud heh vav -he. Now, I tried to talk to somebody in my family about this. That's kind of, you know, Orthodox Jewish. And they didn't want to talk about this at all, at all, at all. Because it's just too clear. It's too clear. So he knows that he's speaking to the Lord and notice also the appearance is in the form of men. And Abraham took this position of humility. He said, you know, who am I but dust? And yet, how can I speak to the Lord? But Abraham intercedes. He intercedes for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Can you believe that? He says to God, would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And we can intercede even for the people of Gaza. That if there are righteous people in there, that God will not destroy them along with the wicked. We don't know how many there are. I, I'm receiving mixed reports. Some are saying that 99% of the people in Gaza support Hamas and support terrorism and want to see Israel destroyed. Others don't say that. But we, we can pray this. We can say, God, will you destroy the righteous along with the wicked? When God destroys, because the, the cry has come up, is so great. The sin is so grievous. Oh, my goodness. This, this past week, we just, they just found like there's a, there's a, a group, the first responders, you know, the paramedics now was uh, they found that they had they had put a baby into the oven. They had burned this baby alive in the oven. They had they had it's just horrendous, horrendous, horrendous. And yet we're called to intercede. 
God, would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And Abraham asked, if, if, we, if you can find 50 people, 50 righteous people, will you still destroy it? And God says, no, for 50, I, I won't. What about 45? Okay, for 45, I'll, I'll spare them. What about for 40? Abraham keeps going down. God, don't don't be angry with me. You know, I just I just want to ask you. He goes down to 30, to 20. Then he gets down to 10. He said, may the Lord not be angry with me, but let me speak just this once more. What if we can only find 10? What if we can only find 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah? And then they stopped. That's where it stopped. Because they couldn't even find 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Not even 10. And so Abraham just went. He just went back to his tent. He just left. He knew there was no more point in even talking about it. Because 10, 10 is such a significant number biblically. 10 is a number of, of testing. It's a number of covenant. Because when they got down to 10, that was a minimum. He didn't say, what about if we only find nine? What if we only find five? What about six? No, 10. That was it. They stopped at 10. Because God said, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. For the sake, this is, this is so important. For the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. 10 is the minimum. It, 10 is the number of testing, is the number of judgment. For example, the 10 plagues on Egypt, um, God sent out 12 spies and 10 came back with a negative report and were destroyed. Daniel was tested for 10 days in Babylon. Israel was tested 10 times in the desert. Laban changed Jacob's wages 10 times. It's also the, the, the number of covenant as in the Ten Commandments. The tenth Hebrew letter of the alphabet, there's Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, Zayn, Chet, Tet, Yud. The tenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet is the smallest, smallest letter. It's just this tiny little line, and it's called a Yud, not a Yod. It's a Yud. It's okay if you call it a Yod, but it's a Yud, and it stands for the word Yad, which is the hand of God. It stands for his power and his authority. With his mighty hand and outstretched arm, he delivered Israel from Egypt. It's at his right hand. Yeshua sits at his right hand. That is the Yad. That is the Yud. It's, it represents power and authority. So 10, think of 10 as covenant testing and judgment when we see a 10 it's it's a test are we going to keep the covenant or are we going to receive judgment for not keeping the covenant now 10 is also the minimum number for the tithe in Hebrew, the, the word for tithe is ma'aser from the word eser, which means 10. Tesha eser. Eser is 10. So 10 is the minimum amount. It's 10%. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And God says, test me in this. It's not just that he's testing us. God says, go ahead, test me on it. You do it as an act of faith. You give 10% of everything you receive as an act of faith and test me on this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out such a blessing, you won't even have enough room to store it. You're going to have to rent a storage space <laughs> to keep all the blessings, the overflow. And then listen to this. This is how it relates I will, for the minimum, for the minimum of 10, the ma'aser, the tithe, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. I will prevent the pest from devouring your crops. The vines in your field will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. This is from Malachi 3.11. So what is God saying? Just like at Sodom and Gomorrah, 
God said, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. God is saying about our finances, for the sake of 10, minimum, I will not allow the destroyer to destroy your finances. I will not allow the enemy to have his hand to dip his finger in your wallet or your bank account and cause problems. I will not allow the devourer. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. This is really an ancient uh, Hebrew, I would say, key to living in God's blessing. Uh, I don't think I know of anyone who practices tithing that is not blessed. And I challenge you, I, I'm preaching to the choir, I know that, but probably somebody's going to be watching this afterwards, this is, I never even heard of tithing. Well, when, when I first came to faith, I'd never heard of tithing. You know, it took somebody teaching the word to teach me about it. I didn't know about it. I saw a lady next to me in church writing out a check for $80, and I was like, what are you doing? I thought you throw a loony or a toony, you know, dollar into the bucket, that's it, you know? But no, she kept, I, I challenge each one of us to keep an account book. You know, when, when we go into a store, we don't just, you know, we buy a pair of jeans. We don't just give them whatever we feel like. I'll give you five bucks for these jeans. No, you know, we, we, we pay what, what price tag is, unless you're like some people I know that like to barter in every store thinking that it's some kind of Israeli shuk or market. But anyways, so we need to make sure we need to keep accounts and we need to keep an account of how much is coming in. And we need to make sure that we are taking that minimum 10%, the, the tie, the maser, one-tenth, of everything we receive and putting it aside, that is the tithe. That is not for us to eat. That is not for us to use for the dental bill or for the car repair. No, that is holy. It is kadosh. It is to be set apart for the Lord. And we can ask God to direct us in our giving and we will have this then to give. It does not belong to us. It says bring. It doesn't say give. It doesn't say give the tithe. That's that's a wrong wrong way to look at it. He's just saying bring bring it because it belongs to God. You're just bringing it back. If you borrow somebody's car and and you give it back to him, are you giving him a car? No, you're just bringing it back. So it's the same with that first ten percent, that first tithe of it's called the first fruits of all of our income of everything we receive. That belong, it belongs to God. It doesn't even belong to us. We're just bringing it back to him. And may the Holy Spirit give us wisdom, especially now where we are to give it. So God says to Abraham, he couldn't even find 10 righteous men. And so he says, I am going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, what was so bad about Sodom and Gomorrah? What was the sin? So most of us know that the major sin was sexual perversion and abominations, homosexuality, but there were other sins. It, uh, this is in Ezekiel 16. It says, look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. So these were people that did not care. They had, they were full of food. They, they, they were abundant, but they were prideful and they did not care about the poor and the needy. This was also the sin of Sodom. And so Lot met the two angels in the square. He insisted in the city square, the plaza, he insisted that they come home with him. He took them home, offered them hospitality. And it says before they had gone to bed, the, the angels and Lot, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, 
surrounded the house and they called out to Lot and they said, where is the man? See, they just look just like men. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so we can have sex with them. They're talking gang rape, homosexual gang rape. This is how depraved they were. Okay, this is totally not politically correct. And I know that our culture accepts homosexuality. But the word of God says, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. It also says in Leviticus 20, 13, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. And in Jude, it relates this to Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, they serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. This is saying that there is a punishment of eternal fire for these, for this kind of um, sexual aberrations. These, this was a picture of a protest at uh, protesters at a gay pride parade in Israel. They were protesting the gay pride parade. And the sign in Hebrew says, which means it's not pride, it's an abomination. Toava is the word for abomination. It's right up there with child sacrifice and bestiality and all kinds of other things that God considers abominations. We have this in Israel. Israel is a sinful nation. It is full of sin against the Holy One of Israel. But God says, I have not abandoned. God says he will not abandon us, even though our land is full of sin against the Holy One of Israel. But here it talks about how they openly display their sin, just like Sodom. This is in Isaiah. It says, the look on their faces testifies against them. They parade their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Have you seen all the, the posts of the um, the homosexual community that are um, pro-Hamas, pro-Palestinian? They're, they're in their parades. They like whip off their clothes and underneath are like disgusting things in the Palestinian colors. So the, the you know what? Because this is all demonic. It is all from the kingdom of darkness. It says they parade their sin like Sodom. They do not even try to hide it. Woe to them. They have brought disaster upon themselves. But I want to say that there is no one that is beyond the, the reach of the arm of God. No one. Someone once said to me, you are the last person in the world that I thought would ever come to faith. You know, it says the arm of the Lord is not too short that he cannot save. It is not his will that even one should perish. But if we see Lot, you know, we, we talked about the inheritance of Abraham, the inheritance of Lot. Lot chose what looked good to his eyes. It looked like the garden of the Lord. It looked good. It was green. It was fertile. That's what he chose. But he, Lot didn't affect Sodom. Sodom affected Lot. Lot didn't, there was not even 10 righteous, including Lot. There was not even 10 righteous men in Sodom. He didn't even win, in all the years that he was there, he didn't even win over nine other people. Not even nine other converts. Instead, he became like them. He was not, a, he did not affect Sodom. Sodom in, infected him because this is disgusting. Lot went out to the, all these homosexuals out there he shut the door behind him and he says please please my brethren do not do so wickedly see i have two daughters i have two virgin daughters let me bring them out to you do do whatever you want to them but please don't touch the men who are under my roof 
Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The depravity of this father that he would sacrifice his, his two virgin daughters rather than the these two men that he doesn't even know, strangers. What has happened to him? What's happened to him is that he lived in Sodom. It's very important where we live and where we choose to raise our children. So what's interesting about this is that the Lord struck them with blindness so they couldn't find the door. It says the man, these were the angels, they reached, they pulled Lot back into the house, shut the door, and then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, that they could not find the door. In Hebrew, that word is the petach. They couldn't find the opening. Yeshua says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. But the wicked, if they do not repent, they can't find the opening. Yeshua said, I am the door. In John 10, 9, I am the door. Yeshua is that blood-soaked door. But if the wicked will not repent of their wickedness and their sin, they can't find the door. They're blind. They've been blinded. Blinded by Satan so that they can't even find the opening to eternal life. They can't find the door. That's why we need to intercede for them. Now, I, I actually love this because... Lot lingers and the angels actually drag him. They pull him. They pull him by the arm, by the hand, him and his two daughters. It says the Lord being merciful, they brought him out and they set him outside the city. You know, I have sometimes prayed, God, pull me by the arm if you have to. If I am somewhere where I am not supposed to be, you know, and I'm I'm holding back for some reason, just just send an angel to pull me out by the arm because I don't want to be anywhere you don't want me to be. And then when they when they brought him outside, the angel said, escape for your life and don't look behind you. Escape to the mountains lest you be destroyed. You know, this place where we're staying, it means um, it comes from a scripture in Isaiah 40, which says, get up to the high mountain and tell the good news to the people of Zion. Isn't that awesome? And the Lord basically pulled us by the arm, you know, to get out of there, get out of where you are, go up to the high mountain and, and tell the people of Zion the good news, that there is salvation, that there is hope, that God say to those who are fearful hearted, behold, your God will come and save you. God is coming to save us, you know? And so here we are and God brought us out of, you know, when we were talking about the warnings, that God gave warnings and God gave us warnings and he warned us to get out of where we were and to come to this place. But it's really important. He says, don't look back. Don't look behind you. And Lot's wife did look back. She looked behind her and she turned into a pillar of salt. And it's really important that when God brings us out of a place, we are not to look back. It says, remember Lot's wife. Yeshua was speaking about the coming. I just want to talk about the, the context of this. Yeshua was speaking about the coming time of destruction. The time of destruction that's coming on, on the world before his imminent return. And what does he say? Remember Lot's wife. In other words, if you got to run, run. Don't look back. Don't, don't even take anything with you. Go and don't look back because, but this is also a lesson for our, for our whole, it's not just about, okay, if something's going to be destroyed, we got to run and don't look back. It's also, if God takes you out of a relationship, if God brings you out of a destructive um, relationship or friendship or whatever it is, you know, stop looking back at like, oh, remember, oh, the good old days. Oh, you know, because looking back kind of symbolizes Eve, or even a longing to return and this was the israelites mistake when god brought them out of egypt they kept looking back oh remember the leeks and the garlics of egypt you know we did that we did that when god brought us out of canada we'd like ah oh, remember burger king remember 
you know, slushies and frosties and, you know, terrible. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not too judgy about anybody because I've probably done it all, but, but uh, it's really important because like Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, I press on, you know, and we've got to forget the past, what God's brought us out of, whether we were a drug addict or we were a prostitute or we were just whatever we were that we are so ashamed of now. We've got to let it go. Whatever mistakes we've made, let it go. Remember Lot's wife. Don't keep looking back. And Yeshua said, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. There's also scripture in Luke 9. It says, no one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Yeshua said, follow me. Follow me. And when we say, Hineni Adonai, here I am, O oh Lord. And we say we're going to follow him. We're not to look back. Because... Faith looks to the future. We've got to have faith for our future and to believe that God has something good in store for us in the future and stop just looking back and trying to go back to what he brought us out of. So the angels actually said, this is incredible. He said, hurry and escape. I cannot do anything till you arrive. Do you believe that? Like they, they, they actually could not even destroy, they couldn't do anything with Sodom and Gomorrah until Lot was in a position of safety. I think that's how, how much merit Abraham had with the Lord. That he knew that Lot was important to him and they had Lot situated, they had Lot in a place of safety So and before he would destroy everything. And then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah and the, from the Lord out of the heavens. And he overthrew all those cities, all the plains, all the inhabitants of the cities and whatever grew on the ground. God completely destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. And as I have said before, this is not going to be politically correct. So if you want it to be, just turn it off now. Just go join some rally. But this is what... I can only say what I what I believe that, that the God has been showing me from the scriptures and just search the scriptures for yourself. This is what I believe that God is saying. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel. And there is a, a scripture. This is a picture actually of Gaza on fire right now. And God says for the three transgressions of Gaza for four, I will not turn away its punishment because they took captive whole communities. I will set a fire on the walls of Gaza. And this, this is from Amos chapter one, uh, verses six to seven. In verse 13, it says, because they ripped open the woman with child. Do you know they actually did that? They actually did that in Israel. They ripped open pregnant women and, and pulled out the baby and left it there on the ground still attached to the mother by the umbilical cord it's so barbaric so barbaric it's beyond words and i take no pleasure in telling you these things but it it's in the bible and it's happening today and it's so relevant and if we don't know what is going on we're going to be deceived i believe god will not destroy the righteous with the wicked I believe God will preserve the lives of those who are truly righteous. But it's God who says that he will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel. God will punish these terrorists for what they have done to Israel. And I found it interesting that when we talk about the war of Gog and Magog, and I'm not saying that's, that's what this is. But God also destroys them with fire and brimstone. God says, I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops and on the many peoples, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. It's like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah when God destroys the troops of Gog and Magog. And then God says, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself. I will be known in the eyes of many nations. And then they will know that I am Jehovah God. They will know that I am the Lord. And over and over again, that this is the purpose. This is the redemptive purpose of God's judgment on the nations 
is that they will know that he that there is a God in Israel, that he is the God of Jacob, that he is Jehovah God, and he rules in Jacob. Now, I found this incredible because here is a picture of Sodom and Gomorrah. And here's a picture of Gaza. It's almost, you can barely tell the difference. The angel said, we are going to destroy this place because the outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. Anyone who does any research whatsoever will understand why this had to be done. So Lot gets out, he goes to the mountains and his wife is turned into a pillar of salt. So he only has his daughters. And it's just so obvious how Sodom not only infected Lot, the father, so much so that he was willing to sacrifice his virgin daughters, but it also infected the daughters. They committed incest with their father to become pregnant. And the firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. This is the father of Moabites. The younger one bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the people of Ammon to this day. And so this sexual perversity of Sodom and Gomorrah, it really in, uh, infected the daughters as well. It produced the Moabites and the Ammonites who were sworn enemies of Israel. But we also need to remember, you know, God is not a respecter of persons. Anyone who will repent and who will say, your God is my God and your people are my, my people are, Welcome, Baruch Haba, Ruchim Abaim, welcome. Come on in. Yes, embraced. Ruth was a Moabite. She was a Moabite woman. They were cursed. They were the enemies of Israel. But because she repented and she said, your people will be my people and your God, my God. And she was embraced and she became in the lineage of the Messiah. That's incredible. So it doesn't matter what nation someone is from. It doesn't matter what who their people are, if they're enemies of Israel. Anybody can come out of that and repent and belong to the family of God. The God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No matter what our background, there is always, always hope. You know, like we've talked about so often that the letter that stands for God is a hay, which is like a door with a little opening left at the top. That means the way is always open to come back to God through repentance. You know, even the son of Hamas, the son of a Hamas leader converted to Christianity is so pro-Israel. I mean, wow, if you see any of his... Look up any of his videos, Son of Hamas. He is a straight shooter. He talks like a <laughs> Middle Eastern, like a Middle Eastern. And he really is speaking the truth. And he knows what he's talking about because he was in Hamas. But he repented and he turned and is embraced. And so um, God also talks about the destruction of Moab and Ammon. These were um, products of incest. They were the enemies of Israel. And God says, I have heard the reproach of Moab, the insults of the people of Ammon, that they have reproached my people and made arrogant threats against their borders. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, surely Moab will be like Sodom and the people of Ammon like Gomorrah, a perpetual desolation. And my people will plunder them and the remnant of my people shall possess them. This is really not good news for the enemies of israel really if we read if we read the scriptures and we read the bible i'm sorry i forgot to put the scripture reference in there 
it is not good. It is really good news for Israel and for all the people who are part of the Commonwealth of Israel. It is really bad news. It is a very serious and a very strong warning to the enemies of Israel. And now is the time to wake up and to repent and to join hands with the God of Israel, with the people of Israel. So um, there is just so much to this Torah portion, but I just want to conclude to go quickly through the rest of it. Um, in Genesis 20, Abraham, he's not a perfect man. He is a little bit of a fearful. <laughs> and so he said to his wife, Sarah, wherever we go, tell them you're my sister, not my wife, because he thought they'd kill him. He's almost like willing to sacrifice his wife. His wife has to go into a harem where she could have been harmed, you know, uh, but God, God took care of her. God warned here again, God warning, God warned Abimelech in a dream that this is the, he says, this is the wife of a prophet. This is Abraham's wife. If you touch her, you're a dead man. And so he's like, I haven't touched her. <laughs> and so uh, he goes to Abraham and says, what are you, what are you playing with me? Why, why did you say she's your sister? He goes, well, technically she is, you know, she's the, 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 the daughter of my, my father, but not my mother. You know, he's kind of like wiggling around with it, but God totally protected Sarah and warned Abimelech in a dream. But because Abimelech had taken Sarah into his harem or whatever, God had closed up all their wombs. And so he asked Abraham, please pray for the women. Abraham prayed for the women and um, they were healed of their infertility. So that's what I'm saying. I feel like this is a bit of a moed, a bit of a set time for us to be praying for people to be healed, women to be healed, men and women to be healed of infertility right now and to be able to be fruitful and multiply. All right. Then we have the birth of Isaac, who was the child of promise. We've talked about that quite a bit, but it's really interesting uh, because there's an analogy in here about in Galatians chapter four, where it talks about casting out the bond woman. What happened is that once Isaac was born, you know, I think it's really important, not only where we raise our children, but who their friends are, who are they hanging out with? Once Isaac was born, Sarah didn't want Ishmael to be around him anymore because you know, the prophecy over Ishmael that he'd be a wild donkey of a man and always causing trouble and always causing conflict wherever he goes. And so she didn't want him around Isaac. And maybe she was right. Maybe she was wise. And she told Abraham to send Hagar and, uh, and Ishmael off. And he didn't want to do it, but God told him, no, it's right. And so he sent them away. And it says to, to cast out the bond woman because the bond woman does not belong with the child of promise. And so it's making this, a uh, comparison between the child of flesh and the child of promise. We've talked about that quite a bit. And it says that the child of flesh will persecute the child of promise. Um, in Galatians 4, you can read that. Uh, it's making a, a, a comparison between the those who are in faith in the new covenant and how those who are still in the Mosaic covenant, some of them persecute the believers persecute the messianic believers do you want me to read it to you from galatians i have it here i'll just read a little bit of it from galatians because um it is written that abraham had two sons one by a bond woman and the, the other by the free woman one by hagar and one by sarah but he who was of the bond woman was born according to the flesh you see, if we if we are not in the will and the time of a God, then we have then we're birthing something in the flesh. And we don't want to do that <laughs> because that is just going to cause problems. And God is really under no obligation to bless and give grace for something that we have birthed in the flesh. 
that it wasn't his idea and it wasn't his timing. And we just had a bread and we just decided to do it. And it says, and the free woman through the promise, which things are symbolic. These are the two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, that's the Mosaic covenant, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. And then it says there is the new covenant that is the new Jerusalem, which is above, which is the mother of us all. And then again, it repeats, rejoice, O barren woman, the scripture. And uh, it says, so therefore, brethren, we are not children of the bond woman, but of the free. We are children of the new covenant. Children of the promise. We are children of promise, not children of the flesh, not children of the bondwoman. So we are free. And whoever the sun sets free is free indeed. Amen. And then Abraham makes a covenant at Beersheba, where we used to live. This was an important covenant that Abraham made with Abimelech at Beersheba. And he calls his name El Olam, which means God forever. Or we could translate it as everlasting God. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. Okay. Uh, and then God, then we come to the um, chapter where God tested Abraham and he asked for the sacrifice of Isaac. He said, I want you to take, this is this beautiful song that you were singing in the beginning. He said, I want you to take your son, your only son. Now it wasn't really his only son. But according to God, in God's eyes, this was his only son because it was the only intended son. He said, I want you to take your son, your only son, your beloved son, and I want you to sacrifice him. And it says, Abraham got up and he took him. He just, he just obeyed. I mean, he must have heard the audible voice of God. But that's like unbelievable obedience that he was ready. But there's something symbolic in this, you know, because sometimes God will give us a promise and then he'll ask us to put the promise on the altar and be willing to release it. Are we willing to put our children on the altar and release them to the Lord? I remember when I had to do that with my eldest son, Clayton, who was just suffering so, so terribly. And it was just such a nightmare to go through it with him and even more so for him. And I, I just remember when I had to just say, okay, Lord, I, I give him to you. I give him into your arms. Father God, you are his father. I, I, I release him to you. I give him to you. And it was really not much longer after that, that he was in the arms of his heavenly father, that he passed from this life into the next day, not suffering anymore I, I i also remember when um was it courtney my eldest daughter was having such a hard time in israel i mean so hard she came at the age of 16 as a teenager she didn't know one word of hebrew and she was thrown into a, a, a israeli public school which is there's no words okay and she 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 came home and she's crying and she said, Mom, I, I, I sat there all day and I didn't know even which classroom to go in. And no one helped me. And they were yelling at me. And they just said, what are you doing here? And I was so pregnant with Leanne, I couldn't even walk. So I couldn't even walk down to the school with her. Then she they finally put her in a classroom. And the kids locked the teacher in, in the room. In the room. And, and they were banging down door. It was just horrendous. And so I kept her home. First, I had the counselor phoning me and saying, how are you sending your daughter to an Israeli public school? How do you expect her to survive there? And I said, yeah, you know, you're right. And so I kept her home. And then I got a phone call. How are you just keeping your daughter at home? You can't just keep her at home. You know, it was so, so hard. And she came, I remember one day she came home and, and things here, you know, don't work a lot of times the way that they should. You know, they post the hours of the library or whatever, and you get there during those hours and it's closed. It just things like that happen all the time because God is just rubbing off all the rough edges and teaching us patience, I suppose. 
And I remember she came home one day, she had walked all the way up the hill and all the way, and it was closed. She walked all the way back down the hill. Her face was beet red. It was so hot. And she just sat down on the curb and she just started to cry. And she just said, I can't, I can't do this, mom. I can't do this. I, I, I want to go back to Canada. And I, Mark, I don't know if you're still on this call, but my brother, Mark, uh, offered her a, a place to stay. And, and she said, mom, I want to go stay with my uncle Mark in Canada. And he took her in and gave her a place. And you know what? I didn't want to let her go, but God said, put her on the altar, put her on the altar. And I did, I had to do that. I said, okay, I, I take my precious daughter, Courtney, and I put her on the altar and I give her to you. And she left, she stayed with my brother for, I don't know, not very long, maybe three months. And then she called me and she said, mom, can I come back home? See, and she made the decision that was now of her own free will. It wasn't because her parents moved. It was her own free will. She made the decision to come back. She is now in two weeks having her sixth child. She has five children. She's married over 20 years here in Israel, uh, living in the mountains of Judea, beautiful, believing family. We were just together with them last night. And so, you know, look what the Lord has done, but we need to put our children on the altar and release them to the Lord, especially those that are not walking with God, those who are, you know, gone astray or whatever it is. Sometimes, or even if God's just given us a promise, we need to be able to also be willing to put that in on the altar if God asks us to. I remember the time when God told us to go back to Canada for a season well we didn't know if it would be a, for a season or not and we were like but god you know your promise is that you would bring us back to the land this is the promise of aliyah that you will gather us from the nations and you'll bring us back to the land and god spoke to me through this put the promise this was the promised child put the promise on the altar and we we needed to do that even if god's made you a promise put it on the altar and we went back to Canada and we were able to be there for the last two or three years of my son's life and to be there for him. So God knows, God knows. And at the last minute, Abraham is there with the knife and he's ready to sacrifice his son, Isaac, his beloved son. But the angel said, stop, don't touch the lad. Because God will provide. That's why he called the name of the place, Yehovah Yir Ed. God will provide. God will see. Now, it's really interesting because Isaac is carrying his own wood for the sacrifice. And interesting, there's rabbinic sources that say just like Isaac carried his own wood for the sacrifice, the Messiah will carry his own piece of wood for his sacrifice yes and it relates it to this instance even in rabbinic literature but isaac said okay i see the you know i see the wood i see the altar you know but like <laughs> hey dad the abba where's the sacrifice and uh abraham i don't know how he had this kind of faith and he said don't worry God will provide the lamb. Now, this was prophetic because then when the angel stopped him, he saw that there was a caught in the thicket and he sacrificed the ram instead of his son Isaac. But it wasn't a lamb. When he said God will provide the lamb, that word in Hebrew is a se, se ha Elohim, lamb of God, se. What was caught in the thicket was a ram that is ayal like a deer or like a ram was caught in the thicket. So it wasn't really at this time that God provided the lamb. When did God provide the lamb? Just like you were singing in that beautiful song, we should sing it again. God provided the lamb in sacrificing his only beloved son, Yeshua. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. 
God understands what it means to lose a son. That is, that is our Torah study for tonight. Yeah, the update on the war and Torah study for tonight. I know it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. But I want, I have these questions for us. If you, I don't know if you want to take a picture, you want to jot it down or just listen. These are some of the things that I think are for reflection and discussion afterwards, because the Torah is so relevant to our own lives. I don't want it to just be some theological, doctrinal, you know, study. I want us to look at our own lives. So number one is, what is that one thing that is a desire of your heart that is yet unfulfilled for so long that you've given up all hope? What seems so impossible, so absurd that it would make you laugh at the thought that it could ever happen? What feels like it's too late or that could never happen to me? That's really something to think about and to examine our hearts, to repent of our unbelief because our unbelief can prevent us from receiving the promise and to trust God's timing and to wait patiently. Number three, is there a situation where you feel like you need God to just pull you out of there? Um, something destructive. Number four, is there an area in your life where you're finding it hard to not look back. This is really a challenge sometimes when God takes us into something new. Is there an area where you're finding it hard to not look back? And number five, are we willing to put our children on the altar and to trust God? Wow. Amen. Amen. So those are some of the suggested uh, questions for discussion afterwards. If you are with us live, I welcome you to stay online and for us to have a time of fellowship, discussion, prayer, Q&A. And I just wanted to also thank each and every one of you for standing with Israel. I know that it comes with a cost. I know that people may not understand you, but God will give you the full reward that he has for you, for your kindness, for your generosity. And I found, I, I came across this scripture in Joel today. It says, Egypt shall be a desolation and Edom, a desolate wilderness because of the violence against the people of Judah, for they have shed innocent blood in their land, but Judah shall abide forever. And Jerusalem from generation to generation. Hallelujah. Am Israel Chai. Am Israel, Am Israel, Am Israel Chai. Am Israel, Am Israel, Am Israel Chai. Oravinu Chai. Oravinu Chai. Our Father still lives. Am Israel lives. This is the rallying cry of our nation in our day. Uh, we are pulling together like never before. Doesn't matter, religious, secular, there are Haredim that are joining the army. It doesn't matter, left, right, whatever. Even the people, these people who were massacred, they were far left. They were peace activists. They were friends with these Gazan people. And the Gazans were coming over. They gave them work. They were coming over just to get information. Oh my goodness, I have to tell you this one testimony that I heard. I don't know if you saw it on our prayer chat. Apparently, when they um, attacked this one, this kibbutz, um, they passed over one house. They didn't even go into the house. They just, or they went into the house, but they just didn't, you know, they, they were in the safe room and they were just being quiet. They didn't come into the safe room. They didn't try nothing. Later, they found out that when these people from Gaza, the workers were coming over and working, and he was gathering information on the kibbutz. They, there was this one family that always went away for Shabbat. They kept Shabbat and they would go to some other family or they would go to some other community for Shabbat. So they would keep Shabbat with somebody else. So they had written, they had written down on this house, just pass it over because they keep Shabbat and they always go away for Shabbat. So they thought they're not home. They didn't even... They didn't even try. 
I think that's just like unbelievable. I, I believe that keeping Shabbat is very, very, very extremely important. Uh, it's not something that I would play around with right now. So Am Yisrael Chai. Od Avinu Chai, our father still lives. So please stick around if you can for at least a short time for fellowship, Q&A, discussion, prayer. We want to pray for Israel together. Um, you're very, very precious people and uh, the faithful remnant. We're little Gideon's army together. And um, if you're just watching the recording, then I just want to say Shabbat Shalom and Shavuot Tov. Have a wonderful, blessed week. And I want to end with a blessing. This is the Birkat HaKohanim, the Aaronic Benediction. And join us next week live. Yes, amen. All right, so just receive this blessing, each one. Close your eyes, hold your, your, your hands out, palms up in the position of receiving. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to... Be anything just because God's banner over each one of us is love and God is gracious and he longs to be gracious to us and he wants to bless us. So receive this blessing from the Lord. Yisa Adonai Panavalecha Veyasem Lecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. And just remember that the Lord has said, I will bless those who bless you and anyone who curses you, I will curse. So now's the time. Thank you for being a blessing to Israel. Spread the word, speak the truth and uh, Shabbat Shalom and Shavuot Tov. So I'm going to just stop sharing right now and, and hang, hang in there. We'll have a little time of fellowship. Stop, share. It's always a challenge. Got it. Okay, bye. Now, stop the recording. <laughs>